Hey, Maya, how's it going? Good, can you see me okay? Okay. <laughs> Muted for my people. I'm sorry, you guys. It's so close. No, it's okay. Um, I'm gonna have to move you. Okay, let's move you here, and then go like this, and then go like this. Okay, we may be good to go here. I think we're okay. okay. Chat. How is her volume? How is my volume? Can you hear everything? Okay. Good. Good. It's fine. Good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. <laughs> Sorry. Good. I'm glad to be here. I'm so excited that you're here. It's been a minute since we've had um, the podcast because I've been traveling and whatever. So I'm super, super excited um, to to be doing it again. I played that video. We have eight dollars donated so far. Yes. Twenty eight dollars. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's awesome. Um, so before we start. Well, you can introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about what you do. I, I mentioned um, that you're a student and generally what your research is, but if uh, if you could talk a little bit more about that, that would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so hey everybody, my name is Imogen Cancellari. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware, which is in the east coast of the United States. I'm currently sitting in my living room in Delaware uh, chatting to you guys today. Um, so my research is really awesome. Um, I think most people probably would say that about their own work though, but um, I am, if you wanted to classify me or put me in a box, uh, my titles are conservation biologist and landscape geneticist. So what that means is I use molecular tools or genetic tools to study the relationship of wildlife uh, to their landscapes. So that's where um, the conservation biology aspect comes in because specifically I'm interested in relationships uh, or ecology between wildlife and landscapes. Um, this relationship is really important because it helps inform conservation decisions and is really useful at varying spatial scales. So think of scales like your backyard to your state to the entire country. Um, in my case, I work in Central Asia, even though I'm here in the US. Um, my study species, the snow leopard, uh, persists across 12 different countries in Central Asia. Uh, they're high altitude mountain specialists, and despite being the coolest of the big cats, um, don't, be, don't at me on that because <laughs> we can talk all day as so long as they're the coolest. Um, despite being the coolest big cat and, you know, really this charismatic megafauna, we know really, we know the least about them in comparison to all the other large cats. Um, this is due to the fact that they're, you know, they're relatively rare, they're elusive, they persist at really, really high elevation, um, anywhere from, you know, 10,000 all the way up to 18,000 feet in elevation, or if you're not on the U.S. system, anywhere from uh, 3,000 to 9,000 meters. Um, and some of these habitats are just really difficult for people to get to. Uh, there's low ox there's low oxygen. It's really cold. There's a lot of snow. It's you know kind of a hostile landscape. Um, and because of that and their low numbers, they're relatively difficult to study. So there are huge gaps in, in our knowledge as to where these cats are, what they're doing, and why they're doing it. Right. Um, my dissertation is kind of trying to address some of those gaps. And that's where poop science comes in, uh, which I can go I into more detail that. a little bit. <laughs> Very cool. Uh -huh. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And can you tell us like briefly about what Panthera is and what that means to you also? Because we have yeah. now $33. Thank you, um, yeah. Info, for, for the $5. Uh, so Panthera is a great organization. It's a nonprofit based in the United States that was founded in 2006. And the organization is devoted exclusively to wild cat conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, it started off with some the big cats, that's the, the big five. So uh, lions, tigers, leopards, jaguars, and snow leopards. Uh, but we also do research, I'm sorry, they also do research on all of the other different cat species as well. So that's everything from you know small cats like your golden cats to your cheetahs and everything in between based on programs that are going on all over the world with many different collaborators okay um so i am a graduate student at the university of delaware uh -huh. i have funding through the university of delaware as well as some other organizations like national geographic society the national science foundation but a large part of my research is funded exclusively through panthera because the project is hugely collaborative i work with a lot of different panthera uh, um, researchers and affiliates as well as collaborators and as a result kind of my 
affiliate status as a student researcher with Panthera has kind of led me to where I am now, which is why uh, they're the organization that I've chosen for today's donation. That's awesome. So donations, okay. Speaking of donations, American Eagle Foundation with $10. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. <laughs> and then Floppy with $50. Thank you. Wow. Um, awesome. So their donations today will be going to Panthera and then going to things like like research grants and supporting people like you and doing your research and, and projects like that. Right, yes. Yeah. So because Panthera is a nonprofit, they do, they, they largely, their budget is largely based on you know, donations like today, and there are a variety of different programs. There's a snow leopard program, there's the Africa lion program, there's the tiger program, there's the small cat program, and there are several different granting agencies or there's some different grants. Like there's a, a fellowship that helps early career biologists go out into a research uh, project in different parts of the world to learn about big cat conservation. And then there's, you know, larger grants that support research like, like my dissertation, um, and then obviously all these different collaborations that are going on. Yeah. Uh, Panthera works with uh, groups all over the world, not just people that work for Panthera. So that's kind of you know where I come to play that. That's how I exist, that's how my project is, it exists. We work with several other different, other different conservation organizations that are already doing work on the ground because they, the people and the organizations are based in the countries of the, the species that are being studied. Okay, very, very cool. So you do work on snow leopards right now and you yeah. did work on, was it bobcats? Yeah, so, um, yeah, my, my master's research was on bobcat landscape genetics in Texas. Um, I started off, let me back up, I started off doing wildlife research in 2010. My very first job after I got my bachelor's degree was in northwest Montana, tracking bobcats not too far from Glacier National Park. Oh, okay. Um, and that's where I just, I fell in love with bobcats. They're awesome. They're these small, feisty little miso carnivores. Uh, miso carnivore is a term for like a medium sized carnivore. Uh -huh. um, and I just think they're super cool. They're really important to the ecosystems they live on. They're these, you know, you know, feisty little generalists that, you know, really persist across a variety of different habitat types and landscapes. And uh -huh. they can kind of adjust well to human uh, territory or urban environments as well. Um, so for my master's, I was really interested in understanding genetic structure, like how across Western Texas are bobcats genetically structured? Meaning, uh, when we define populations and wildlife, we often are looking at uh, arbitrary study areas, like um, you know the state of California could be a study area. Like, what are the bobcat populations in California? Uh -huh. However, bobcats don't adhere to state lines or country lines. They adhere to other different things on the landscape, like resource availability or mountains as barriers or highways as barriers. And I was interested in kind of looking at that from a molecular perspective to see how individual bobcats are moving across landscapes, mm -hmm. because ultimately a population is is is, is structured by genetic similarity, like how similar are animals here and how similar are animals here. And if they're really different, they classify as two different populations. Mm -hmm. If they're genetically the same, they're probably gonna be one population because individuals from here are taking their genes to individuals over here and they're they're crossing with one another. Right. And so that's kind of like, that was what I, I did for my master's degree. And that's what I'm interested in professionally is kind of continuing that type of research because it tells us uh, how individuals are moving across landscapes and across mm -hmm. time. So how does, um, that, how does knowing that help with conservation? Then? Yeah, so the reason that it helps knowing with conservation is because, you know, when we manage a population of any given species, so first, wildlife management and conservation is about managing populations, not individuals, because lots of individuals are what we're interested in. So we're interested in whatever populations are, but unless we determine what the population is, it's kind of an arbitrary uh, assignment, it's an arbitrary label. Mm -hmm. So by understanding, you know, okay, like, I'm pretending this is Texas and this is Texas, my head is like, you know, like a barrier in between, you know, like say my head is like a giant highway or something and bobcats can't get between these two, uh -huh. if we're thinking that bobcats like on this side of the highway are connected to and are genetically the same as bobcats on this side of the highway, uh -huh. and we're applying the same management decisions in both areas, but they're not actually the same, like say these bobcats are experiencing low population numbers or they're being over harvested, or there's a lot of disease going on in the area, but this population is healthy. If we're assuming that this population is healthy, like just like this one, we could be inadvertently hurting this one by accident. Okay. So understanding by doing, you know, by testing, okay, is this highway in my head uh, a barrier to gene flow? We can then understand, yes, they are genetically different, but this is the reason why the highway or my head or right. whatever it might be. Um, I just understand 
sorry, I just, uh, my computer turned off. Okay, um, this helps us understand where discrete populations are. In contrast, it can also help us identify corridors for movement, so basically natural highways. If we only have like a million dollars to protect a national park somewhere in China, for example, mm -hmm. or we want to create a national park in China, or maybe in Pakistan or in India, and we wanted to protect snow leopards, it's important for us to understand where are the mountains, where are the rivers, what corridors for movement best facilitate these individuals being connected or different populations being connected to one another. Mm -hmm. Because if we basically only have a million dollars and we want to create a park, it makes the most sense for us to put that park where we know there are we know there are snow leopards, we know there are good resources, and we know that these snow leopards can actually be connected to one another or they have enough resources in order to persist across long periods of time. And so if we didn't have information about their movement, we're kind of just, you know, basically trying to pin the tail on the donkey right. without having all the information in front of us. Got so it. molecular data is just another way to, it's just another tool in our conservation toolbox. And that, that's basically what I do. Okay, very cool. So we have Tex with $7, Panda with $10, Goblin with $5, McPherson with $100, you're a legend, awesome. thank you so much. Um, a few other donations, guys. Thank you so much. We're at two hundred and thirty dollars. Really, wow. really appreciate that. You guys are insane and so quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah, it's insane. So, let's talk about. I'm really interested in the fecal DNA <laughs> piece. I yeah, think that's super interesting. <laughs> so, did you do that with bobcats as well, or is that just snow leopards? Yes. No, I did that with bobcats. Uh, okay. Well, the very first uh, project that I ever. Um, I, I studied fecal material with was uh, back in 2011. I did an internship at the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have a conservation biology institute, which is separate from the National Zoo. It's basically like a conservation breeding facility where they house uh, important species like cheetahs, red pandas, platted leopards, uh, Maine wolves, um, bison, all types of cranes. It's a really cool facility. Mm -hmm. um, but they have you know a research lab out there, and they have dorms for interns. So I lived out there for three oh, months. Cool working on a clouded leopard endocrinology project. That's so cool. Um, yeah, so what we were trying to do is, so in captivity, you know, I work with wild, like wild, free ranging wildlife, mm -hmm. but the other side, you know, for uh, what is it, my friend Ellie did your podcast recently, yes. and she talked a lot about the, the importance of captive wildlife for research. Uh -huh. um, it's two sides of the same coin, they really operate well together. Um, at the Smithsonian, you know, they're trying to better understand um, obviously, they do wild. They do free-ranging wildlife research, but they also do some captive-based research, particularly because, as you know, our, our zoo animals are basically our reserve for animals in the wild. If something goes awry, or you know, basically they're extirpated from the wild, you can take um, individuals from a zoo of known genetic pedigree and put them back into the wild. In mm -hmm. theory, um, it's not quite as simple as that, but basically that's the whole premise. Um, that in order to do that however you have to have animals bred in captivity and some species do well others don't like tigers for example for some reason they just breed really well in captivity they they naturally mate um they have really good conception they raise their young really well mm. other species have a really hard time um one of those species is the clotted leopard um for what you know a variety of different reasons they don't do well in captivity so natural mating is a problem there's a lot often aggression you, males and females will sometimes kill each other in captivity so the next step for us is artificial insemination right. um artificial insemination works really well in cheetahs and tigers i believe but it doesn't work in clouded leopards uh, mm -hmm. very well either so when i was at smithsonian we were trying to better understand their reproductive um, hormone system so we could start, so those researchers could begin an in vitro fertilization protocol in order to impregnate females in captivity mm -hmm. for conservation purposes. Okay. Um, and in order to do that, you have to look at their hormones. In order to do that, you either have to have blood or hair or urine or feces. Mm -hmm. um, because these hormones that we produce in our bodies, you know, they start in our brain, they produce in our reproductive organs. Um, they're excreted through uh, bodily materials. And um, the the uh, material that I was working with was poop or fecal material. Mm -hmm. And basically I spent three months at the Smithsonian banging frozen cat poop with a mallet <laughs> to okay. uh, get it down to a powder form so we could then extract uh, hormones from it to evaluate hormone levels to study different fluctuations for that in vitro protocol that I just described. Um, and basically what it meant was that every day for three months I was cleaning cat poop like out of my ears. Oh my god. <laughs> and, you know, like you wear masks and stuff, but yeah. there's not really anything to do to get it out of like your ears and stuff. Oh my god. Um, 
So that was my first intro to fecal DNA. Um, I don't, it sounds weird, but I was hooked after that. Um, you know, cat poop in my ear canal, all things considered. Um, it's a great way to study wildlife without um, stressing them out. Yeah. So, you know, I've done a lot of different really cool projects where we live capture wildlife. So, you know, I've helped radio collar bobcats, and bears, um, and, and uh, small mustelids like martens. Um, and that's an amazing that's an amazing way to study animals, but it's not the only way that we can understand how animals move across landscapes or learn about them for conservation purposes. The benefit of using poop is that I can go out into, you know, the mountains or in the desert and try to find the poop of my target species, pick it up and take it back to the lab and then analyze it without ever having to come into contact with my target species. Right. Um, and the benefit of that is that ultimately. It requires I don't want to say it requires less man hours or, or less person at people hours because, you know, finding the poop is really difficult, especially for something like a snow leopard when you have to, like, you know, climb up to, like, 15,000 feet and hike around a mountain with no oxygen. Um, you know, but it ultimately requires less intensive uh, interaction with the animal. And that's definitely the goal because capturing an animal and anesthetizing it and handling it is stressful, obviously. I mean, an animal that doesn't like people and you put it, you know, you, you've trapped it in a cage or you've, you know, caught it in a snare, um, you know, for harmless purposes, but the animal doesn't know that. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's not bad to do that. That has its place and it's wonderful for conservation, like Panthera, you know, I, I work with a lot of people that are experts in this type of work and I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. um, but this is just another way that we can non-invasively, that's the term, we're non-invasively collecting information about wildlife. Um, and so the way that I do it, and tell me if I'm like going on this crazy monologue, Maya, because no, I could just talk do. about like poop all day long. You're totally um, fine. Even, like, I don't have poop in front of me right now, um, but I'm gonna use like, uh, let's see, I'm gonna use this candle as an example. Okay. So if I go out into the mountains, I'm looking for snow leopard poop. The first thing is that, well, not all poop is created equal, and not all poop obviously is gonna come from the same animal. Like I could have gone up on the mountain yesterday or like a wolf could have pooped or, you know, a snow leopard could have pooped. So right. the first thing is, you know, I, I don't collect everything. Uh, we're a little discriminant about it. And the way that we're discriminant about it is because everybody's, every species, just almost every single species, their poop looks different. Uh -huh. So it's relatively easy to distinguish cat poop from dog poop. Um, it's relatively easy to distinguish, uh, let's see, like rabbit poop from deer poop. Mm -hmm. And having that knowledge of like the physiology and the appearance of poop or scat, that's the term that we use is scat, S-C-A-T. Understanding that is really helpful because then you can be like more discriminant in your like investigative search to finding the target species that you're interested in. So when I go up on the mountain, I'm looking for cat poop. It looks, you know, for those of you who are watching, if you have cats and you've scooped a litter box, basically all cat poop looks like some version of that. It's like lobulated it's like little teeny like round segments that are kind of mm -hmm. together yep. whereas dog poop is like wild dog poop is more stringy like it's not there aren't as many segments that are like uh put together and the ends are always like pinched off like the end of the end of dog poop kind of always looks like the end of my hair it's like twisted kind of like that sure. uh -huh. anyways I'm not sure if you were interested in learning that today, but now you no, know. No, I know. I know what you're um, talking about. I get it. <laughs> so those are the first things that we really, really look for. And you can tell it's carnivore poop because of the shape. And sometimes you can see bones or hair in there. And, you know, obviously an herbivore is not going to be eating, you know, bones. Um, so once we go up into the, you know, up into the mountains, we're looking for something that looks like cat poop. If it looks like cat poop, I pick it up mm -hmm. because, well, hopefully it's snow leopard, but it could also be lynx. It could mm -hmm. be palace cat. Um, or depending on what part of snow leopard country I'm in, it could also be common leopard. Mm -hmm. um, so we collect that data and we, we store it in, in a way that's appropriate for uh, preserving DNA, which is dry and uh, it, dry and cool and in the dark. So I take test tubes out into the woods that have desiccant, like those little beads that when you buy a pair of shoes, they have those little like salt and pepper packets, with little beads in them. Mm -hmm. That's called desiccant and it dries. It, it basically leaches moisture out of okay. whatever it comes into contact with. And moisture is like the enemy of good quality DNA. So we put these, we put the poop in these test tubes and then we take it back to the lab and then we do what's called a DNA extraction. So I'm literally taking the poop and leaching the DNA out of it and then hopefully uh, identifying it as snow leopard using species specific genetic markers. So back to the candle. Uh, the reason that it's relevant is because if you have a poop, pretend that this is, you know, like, like a, a snow leopard poop. Uh -huh. um, what I do with it, as opposed to just like taking a cross section of it, 
Um, I'm interested in just hopefully what is snow leopard DNA cells. And when an animal defecates, when the feces moves through their intestines, they shed uh, off epithelial cells. So those are cells in the lining of your intestines. And any of the cells in your body, any of the cells in my body contain my DNA. But when a snow leopard poops, they've got their DNA as well as the DNA of anything they've eaten. Okay. And so if I were to just to take a bunch of it, like take a cross section, like slice a cookie cutter of it, I would be getting all kinds of, you know, microbial DNA or maybe Ibex uh, or Argali, which is snow leopard prey. I'd get their DNA as well as a snow leopard's DNA. Right. So what we do when we get in the lab is I take a little scalpel. And if this is like the, you know, the cylinder of the poop, I basically take a scalpel and I scrape off the outer edge of the poop because that's what most likely came into contact with the snow leopard's epithelial cells. And then I do the extraction based oh. on that. And then if we determine that it's snow leopard, we use, uh, usually we use mitochondrial markers. Um, basically they're kind of like, um, if you, when I say markers, think of it as like little bookends. These bookends have like fluorescent labels on them. And these fluorescent labels bind to the target DNA that they're, they were created to basically stick to. And those individual segments of DNA are gonna be different based on me, based on my cat sitting in the window, based on snow leopard. And that's how you de determine whether it's, you know, wolf or snow leopard yeah. or bear, or unfortunately, sometimes human. Wow. Um, and then if we determine that it's snow leopard, then I know, okay, I've got snow leopard DNA. I can put the poop away. And then I've got, you know, extracted DNA, which is basically just going to be like a little bit of liquid um, after a series of washings. And then from that liquid, then I basically put together the puzzle of individuals. So we use more markers that basically give us a genotype or a kind of a, a puzzle of individuality for each individual snow leopard. So then I can determine, say I've got 20 of these, you know, vials of snow leopard liquid DNA. I need to know, do I have 20 individuals or do I have 10 or do I only have two because I picked up the same animals poop a bajillion times. Right. Um, and then once we have individuals, then we can start doing more rigorous analyses. Like that's all the raw data. And then from that, then we start, we can basically use genetic, or we use different, sorry, we use different like uh, statistical programs and genetic programs to understand, okay, well now we've got 20 individuals. Are they all one population? Mm -hmm. Are they two populations? And you know, if they're different, then we can start examining what on the landscape is structuring uh, the differences or the similarities that we're seeing. And then how is that informative for conservation? Okay. And so all these like big questions, these, these big picture things that you know involve governments and different agencies and the people living alongside wildlife, we can address some of these just from going out into the woods and picking up poop. Oh my gosh, that really is a puzzle, holy cow. Also, this is a great candle. By the way, I'm not getting paid to say this, but it smells really good. Okay. <laughs> good. I'm, I'm glad it doesn't poop. smell like cat poop. Okay. Right, actually, I just, so I just realized, I just got back from, uh, I, I went to home to Houston to visit my family over the holiday, and we uh -huh. came back two days ago, and we walked in the house and we were like, it does like it doesn't something smells off in the house like we clean the fridge out you know like we had friends taking care of our pets like what smells bad and we couldn't figure out what it was and yesterday last night i was and all of a sudden it hit me it's because right before the holidays um one of our collaborators brought some uh snow leopard scat uh oh brought me some scat from kyrgyzstan and since we were getting ready to leave the next day i didn't have time to take it in the lab so i just <laughs> threw it in my freezer Oh my god. So I have I have like uh, 15 miles of snow leopard poop in my freezer right now. And I'm pretty sure that's why my house is smelling like a little funky. Because even though they're in test tubes and triple bag, like carnivore poop does not, I mean, it's just a lot of biology, man. Like it doesn't smell fantastic. That's so funny. How, how hard is it to find scat in the wild of snow leopards? I mean, how, how often do you come across that? How long do you have to be out there looking for it? Like, I'm yeah, sure I know so, it's different every time, but... No, that's like the, the golden question. So part of the reason, like I said earlier, the reason is because they're so difficult to find. Like mm -hmm. if you're doing like a cat train project where you want to radio collar cats, you know, you gotta go where the cats are and then you have to catch them. So, you know, cats are, you know, like all wildlife, it's difficult to capture them sometimes because they're wary of any type of human um, structure on the landscape. Like wolves, for example, if they like see a trap, they will often like dig it up because they're like, I know this is bad. I don't like it. I got to get rid of it. They want to expose it and get rid of it. Right. Um, you know, cats are, you know, they're like carnivores are very wary. Um, I have to say though, the whole like a dodge of like curiosity killed the cat is, is, is kind of true because you know, all of all the cat species that I've worked with, you can eventually capture them if live capture is your goal because they're just so darn curious. Uh -huh. Um, 
like when I worked on the Bobcat project, we were trying to capture Bobcats, we would use like old CDs, like actual like old fashioned CDs that you put in like an audio player to play music. And you'd, we'd hang them from some fishing line not uh-huh. far from the trap. And it, you know, it, it like blows in the wind and it's really shiny. Uh-huh. And you're like, oh, shiny, like they can't resist. Oh my God. Um, but anyway, it's like, so that's difficult, but it's another thing to try to actually find the animal when it's not there. Because, you know, if the whole goal is to not interrupt the animal, you have to find where the animal was versus where the animal is. Uh-huh. And so how do you actually do that? Obviously I talked about identifying the individual scats, um, but when it comes to snow leopards, the, the beneficial thing about snow leopard uh, behavior and their ecology is that they're relatively predictable if you know what to look for. Okay. So snow leopards are high elevation mountain specialists, meaning that they live often at or above tree line at really high elevation mountains in Central Asia. Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, they're not made of snow, but they are snow specialists. <laughs> they, everything about them is adapted for snow. So they've got these huge like snowshoes. They've got lots of fur around their feet. Um, they've got like this double coat that's really thick and they've got a tail that's as long as their body that, you know, they use as a rudder when they're diving down mountains to hunt, but they can also use it as like a body scarf, kind of like when they're sleeping to kind of keep their faces uh, hidden from the cold. Cool. Um, but because of all of those, because they're adapted to the mountain, there are specific things that we know about their behavior that helps us find their scat. So if you picture like a mountainside full of cliffs, um, in Central Asia, like it's really high elevation. There's, you know, it's really jagged. It's kind of this angry looking landscape. A snow leopard's gonna live on that. And, and when it comes to trying to identify where a snow leopard is gonna poop, snow leopards defecate and uric- urinate to mark their territory. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to marking territory, we're looking for things that stand out. So like the top of a mountain, like the ridge line. So like, if this is a mountain, Mm-hmm. This top part, like where my fingers are, is considered the ridge line. Mm-hmm. And so whole mountains have these long linear ridge lines, and snow leopards will patrol that as they're patrolling their territory and looking for prey. Um, and they will mark their territory at the tops of mountains. So marking their territory, urinating, uh, defecating. They also will leave, they will also do the same thing along, you know, edges of mountains, at the tops of mountains, along large boulders. So think of it kind of like as biology's email system. If it stands out on a landscape to you, it's probably going to stand out to a snow leopard. So if we go up the mountain, we, we look at a mountain, we know that there are snow leopards there because there is snow leopard prey and because we also work with local researchers and local communities who live alongside these amazing cats. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we, we can't get anything done without, you know, government collaboration as well as the people that live alongside wildlife. So, you know, conservation, as a side note, is very important when it comes to communities. Like, it's not just me you know, an American going over to Central Asia and saving the day, like not by a launch. You know, I'm just like a, a you know, a, a, clog, a clog in the wheel, I guess, um, or a peg in the wheel of this huge, like uh, collaborative uh, process. And and basically what happens is if, you know, we go out into the, into the mountains because we're working with locals, we know that they've seen cats there, they live alongside these cats. Um, and we basically go up in the mountains, we hike all the way to the top, and then we start searching. We know there are cats there, and then we start looking for individual things that a snow leopard would want, like would probably leave an email on. So large boulders, large open uh, spaces of greenery. And then we just basically do surveys that way. Depending on the project, the survey could either be like, oh, we have to walk you know, three kilometers in one direction to try to find all the scat samples we can, or you know, if we're doing it opportunistically based on the study design, based on our research goals, you know, we're going to different areas and doing like quick rapid searches to try to kind of collect as many scats as we can from as many different locations. Um, and so in that sense, yeah, it's time consuming. It's physically very difficult, but if you have um, the support of the local community and you know what to look for, I would say it's like relatively, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's not as difficult as it sounds when you have those tools in your toolbox. Um, and so this fall, I was in Kyrgyzstan for a month working with um, a lot of our collaborators uh, through Panthera, as well as different nonprofits that are based in Kyrgyzstan, to do exactly that. So there was a team of five of us. We were basically doing transects um, in different parts of southeastern and southwestern Kyrgyzstan to try to get samples um, from areas that have not been studied uh, from a genetic perspective. Um, and we're just like hiking up in the mountains and collecting samples. And wow. I think we collected, let's see, it was like four weeks. Um, five of us, well, there were five of us that were researching and then we would, peer, we, all, we had a lot of Kyrgyz herders and government officials that would come out with us and help. So we had anywhere from like five to like nine people that were hiking on mountains on any given day. And we came back with 
63 scat samples that we think are snow leopard. Oh. Um, I'm getting ready to start doing some genetic analyses in 2020, uh, starting this month. So I don't know how many of those are snow leopards and I don't know how many individuals there are, but because everybody on the team um, is considered like a snow leopard expert, you know, we're hoping that we're gonna have like at least 50% um, uh, accuracy with identifying snow leopards. So okay. that's really good. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. Oh my gosh. Okay, we have a few more donations I'm gonna shout out here. Um, Wolven with six dollars. Sniper with twenty five dollars. Thank you, Sniper. Um, Thank and then you. Anonymous with ten dollars. So speaking of viewer donations, there are also a couple viewer questions that I have um, here that have come in. Um, one is, well, they're we're no longer talking about poop, if that's okay with you. That's okay, that's yeah, okay. yeah, I just went like on a lawn poop monologue. No, so. I, was, I was like the most interested in that. I appreciate all of that, that was super interesting. Um, so one of the questions is how old can snow leopards get in the wild? And then another one is how many cubs does a snow leopard have in one birth cycle? Yeah, so um, snow, anything in captivity lives a lot longer than what animals that in the wild do. Uh, mm -hmm. The oldest uh, that we know of is between 10 and 12 years. Okay. Um, and so that, you know, if everything went well, they weren't, you know, they always had food and they always had enough uh, habitat to meet all their resource needs and there weren't, it wasn't hunting or poaching. In theory, like a male or adult female could live to 10 or 12 years. And what was the second question? Um, how many cubs does it, does a snow leopard have in one birth cycle? Ah, yeah. So, um, it, that depends on the individual's genetics as well as the resources for that given year, but on average they have between two and three. Okay. Um, I wanted, there's a, there, the only, the longest, most in, uh, intensive study going on in snow leopard countries in Mongolia, mm -hmm. another organization called the Snow Leopard Trust um, has been uh, doing, they have this like collaring study that's like 15 years. Mm -hmm. They've been tracking individuals since they were born through adulthood um, and, and learning a lot about, uh, a lot of what we know about how, how they give birth, what their, some of their secret behaviors are, is as a result of that study. Okay. Um, it averages like two to three. Okay, cool. I'm glad. I'm glad you talked about that. I had when I posted this on my, on my Instagram. One of my coworkers. I work at a zoo, um, and one of my coworkers was like, "Ask her about the snow leopard trust. Like it's the coolest thing ever." So yeah, that's good. he'll be he'll be very happy about that. Um, how are snow leopard populations doing? I did a little bit of research yesterday, and I know that they're listed as vulnerable. Yeah. Right, and I guess it's hard to know because yeah. Okay, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2016, snow leopard, so since, oh my gosh, I totally know this thing. It's like since 2000, I'm not going to tell you the year that they became endangered. <laughs> That's I fine. can't remember the, I used to, I used to, like, give me that. Um, but anyways, the snow leopard was listed as endangered in 2016. Okay. And the reason it was uplisted, so it basically went from endangered to vulnerable, which means like the, the, the listing for IUCN, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, they do designations for species based on their numbers and their threats. Obviously endangered is bad, critically endangered is more bad, and then extinct is pretty bad. Right, right. <laughs> um, and then there's iterations below that. So vulnerable is the next step up, or the, the, it's, the, it's a little bit less bad than endangered, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, they were uplisted from endangered to vulnerable because of new information we have about population estimates. So we can estimate populations in a variety of different ways, and there are different criteria to establish um, designations. And new research based on the potential number of breeding adults in the global population of snow leopards suggested that the number, the minimum number, was higher than the threshold for endangered status. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they were uplisted to vulnerable. Okay. That's good in theory, um, but obviously, like I said, there's still a lot that we don't know. In reality, we've only sampled, a, like intensively researched and sampled about 3% of snow leopards range. Um, you know, they persist across like 2 billion kilometers across Central Asia, so that's 12 different countries, everywhere from like Russia, Mongolia, curving around to some of the stands like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. They also exist at the top of India, Nepal, and 60% of their range is in China. Mm -hmm. Um, and when it comes to, you know, their status and how, what we know about their populations, obviously I already said that we don't know a lot about individual populations, but when it comes to their overall status, in some areas, it seems like they might be stable, like in certain parts, in small parts of, 
uh, like Qinghai province, uh, province in China where the habitat is good um, and there's not there's regulations against poaching. There's not a lot of poaching going on. Those small populations are stable. But realistically, when it comes to considering the global distribution, snow leopards are expected to be in decline. Um, the uplisting doesn't reflect that decline so much as it reflects um, an increase in our knowledge about how many animals there are likely to be on the landscape, which is anywhere from seven or four thousand, like four thousand five hundred to uh, eight thousand some individuals. It's somewhere in that sliding scale, and that sliding scale covers the threshold to be in a vulnerable uh, designation versus an endangered de designation. Okay. That makes sense. Somebody in chat also just asked, is the reason why some populations are dwindling because the fur is sought after, or what are what are the threats to snow leopards? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, whoever asked it, a lot of different threats to snow leopards. Um, in certain countries, uh, the black market, the trade for uh, wildlife parts is a huge issue. Um, so, you know, in Southern Asia, there's like the black market fur trade that impacts, you know, tigers, your small, so a lot of your small cats, like your clouded leopards, um, but as we're seeing tiger numbers you know dwindle significantly the the demand the demand is increasing but the supply is decreasing and in order to compensate for that people are going or looking to other species um snow leopard poaching has existed uh irrespective of um or, you know regardless of tiger poaching but as the demand for or the supply for tigers and other species dwindles poaching for other species is going to increase mm -hmm. um there I see in the 90s, poaching was a huge problem for snow leopards. Um, different countries have cracked down on that. The wildlife trafficking trade um, is still a huge problem, but it's not as persistent in as many countries as it used to be. There are five countries, realistically, where poaching has been really uh, predominant. Uh, I always mix up which ones they are. I think Afghanistan is one. Um, maybe Nepal is another. Uh, parts of Pakistan um, have, have had problems in the past with snow leopard poaching. Um, but it's gotten a little bit better, which is in part for the reason that we think that, um, you know, they've been uplisted from endangered to vulnerable. Um, but other threats include uh, poaching of their prey. So it's not just snow leopard poaching that's a problem. It's poaching and hunting, unregulated hunting of things like Argali and Ibex and Markhor. Okay. Um, you know, regardless of whether or not you stand um, personally on hunting, hunting can be a great tool for conservation because it prevents populations from growing out of control mm -hmm. and when populations like deer populations grow out of control they eat all the vegetation and they impact so many other species mm -hmm. and eventually when you have too many animals that in, a, in an area that exceed their carrying capacity like the landscape can't support that many animals too many animals come into contact they often get diseases and then the whole population crashes so it's this really like problematic artificial cycle but on the other end if you don't have any kind of management if you don't you know uh protect you know different species from poaching the opposite obviously happens of just having too many animals taken off the landscape. And in the case of snow leopards, in a lot of these different countries, poaching for the trophy animals, like the you know the big goats with the large horns, is dwindling or is reducing snow leopard populations because they're just not as there's not as much food on the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, other things like you know oil development and hydro for like dams across Central Asia can threaten snow leopard populations. But another big thing that you know is problematic that's really hard for us to address right now is climate change. Um, obviously, it's all in the news. Everyone hears climate change. I think it's a hot buzzword, but for snow leopards, the reality is that Central Asia is warming faster than the rest of the world. Um, and snow leopards, we talk about them being these mountain ghosts. They live at what we call the roof of the world. And the question is, where do you go if you already live at the top of the world? Right. If as these habitats are shrinking, as as it gets warmer, um, you know, we're having less snow, and basically that means that tree line is rising. So as there's less snow, as it warms. The trees that can't handle really cold environments can start handling environments at higher elevations and that we call that tree line rise and that basically shrinks the habitat above it and the snow leopards often live above that tree line um, and so when we're trying to race against all these issues simultaneously it certainly is problematic i've never heard of that tree line rise part that's interesting yeah. i was just going to ask you about climate change um thanks to jordan good question there and it was sneaky the sniper's question um about the the threats to snow leopards so thank you um, what other questions that we have? I'm trying to find like a good segue here. Uh, so speaking of, of unregulated poaching or, or hunting being a problem for snow leopards, um, what are, you mentioned a few, a few species, but what are the main sources of food for snow leopards? Someone asked, Snitch asked if they can, ca if they eat birds as well. Yeah, they do actually. Um, what is it called? Let me look it up. So like, uh, the first scat that we found, and I'm going to talk while I'm looking it up on my 
right species name. Um, when we were in Kyrgyzstan, the first scat that we found was on our very first day out in the field. And um, we found a scat and it looked a little funky and we were kind of debating whether or not it was wolf or snow leopard. Mm -hmm. But we decided at the last minute and we collected anyway, so we could still be wrong. But we decided that it was definitely snow leopard because about a hundred feet from the scat, there are a bunch of feathers everywhere and there were snowcock feathers and snowcocks are a, um, a bird that's in the pheasant family and they live in parts of Central Asia. Um, and like a lot of it is in like China and Southwestern China, but we were in Southeastern Kyrgyzstan, so the ranges overlap. Um, wolves can't catch snowcocks because they can fly and realistically when it comes to just like how they um, ambush their prey, you know, snow leopards, um, they've got retractable claws, they climb trees, they climb boulders more than wolves do. And so that kind of um, gives them the tools to be able to be more successful at catching birds regularly than something like a wolf would be. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say wolves never do it. It's just something that, you know, snow leopards are good at. And apparently in Southern Kyrgyzstan and parts of China, the um, snow leopards definitely like to catch these small birds. Okay, very cool. Yeah, oh, but and also the, it, when, to answer the question, outside of birds, they eat a lot of ungulate species. Um, so that includes things like ibex, argali, blue sheep, markhor. Um, these are all different big ungulates that live in different parts of Central Asia. Um, during the summer, uh, snow leopards really love marmots. And though we have those here in the U.S., it's a different, it's a different species, but they're just like really fat rodents that live underground. Um, and a cool thing is that when I was in China this summer, uh, we were on the Tibetan Plateau, and I saw four snow leopards, uh, which was I, amazing. Um, we saw two of one snow leopard. We saw twice. So it was really three snow leopards, four encounters. And both times that I saw this one female, she was hunting. Uh, the first time that I saw her, so it had snowed that morning, it was July and it had snowed, so the whole landscape was white and beautiful and we were working to try to find them that morning and I was with a birder and if you know birders, birders, I mean, man, they have got vision, they have got like eagle eye vision, like no pun intended. These, these if you're a birder, you're used to looking for small things that flit about through binoculars and they just have vision capabilities that blow my mind. So I was with a birder who um, has seen a lot more snow leopards than I have. And he spotted her first. And I like happened to turn my binoculars just in time to see a snow leopard, like cresting over the top of a mountain and diving down through the snow. She charged down this mountainside to an entire herd of blue sheep. That's amazing. And it was like this magical blue planet, planet Earth, like Disney moment that I just, you know, it was just completely unreal. And she didn't catch it, unfortunately, but it was still just amazing to watch. And then a, about a week later, we saw the same female um, and it, there was no snow. It was all this, you know, the same mountains. It was in the same mountainside, like 100, like 500 meters from where we'd seen her the first time. And it was like all beautiful. Like the whole mountainside was like green, bright green dotted with like white and pink and yellow wildflowers. I mean, again, it looked like this Disney scene. And this snow leopard, she came charging down the mountain again in kind of like this little gully, like this little like recess in the, in the earth. Mm -hmm. And she ran down the mountain and stopped like behind this like giant cluster of grass. And she was just like hide, like all you could see were her eyes. That's so and she cool. was watching this marmot that was standing in the grass that had his back to her. And she just exploded over the landscape on the grass and covered like 50 feet in like four seconds. Oh and gosh. dove down into the marmot hole and just like, I mean, she must have gotten like a claw on it, but she didn't get, she didn't get it. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, she's got her like, backside up in the air because she's in this marmot hole and the tail just starts flicking and we knew she hadn't gotten it because she was super ticked off but um it was awesome but anyways they also they eat marmots um yeah. marmots make up a large portion of the summer diets of all both males and females but females because these marmots are just like bowling balls man like they weigh they weigh <laughs> like 12 pounds and it's just like they're solid fat they're like i'm trying to like find something to like demonstrate how big they are like this is like my laptop case like a marmot's like this big oh my and gosh so, like, they you know provide a lot of you know food resources uh you know through their fat and their meat uh for snow leopards which is really important for lactating females or females that are nursing cubs um, yeah which is really cool cool somebody somebody did ask snitch rob two 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 one um said how fast can a snow leopard run speaking of oh i don't know that. so what is it um i don't know like miles per hour or kilometers per hour so like what is it like uh, cheetahs can run like 43 miles per hour and they go from 60 or no it is 43 like snow leopard or a uh, uh, cheetah can go from like 
zero miles per hour to like 43 miles per hour in three seconds. Okay. Um, snow leopards aren't that fast. They work on different landscapes. They're ambush predators, meaning that they'll sit and wait. Um, and then when prey gets close enough, after they've, they, they've stalked it and they get close enough, then hopefully they can ambush it and, and catch it. Um, there are a lot of really, there are only a couple videos on YouTube of snow leopard hunts. Um, it's not something that's really uh, well documented, like in publicly available uh, media. Mm -hmm. um, what is it like Planet Earth 2 got some phenomenal footage. I don't know where they were, but like the videographers got four snow leopards at the same time on camera. And it was like a mother and her Whoa. cub. And an adult male came in to try to breed her. And then another male came in for the same thing. And it was just like helter skelter. And that doesn't usually happen. Um, it's just wild. But uh, when it comes to hunting, yeah, I don't actually know how fast they are. But having seen that female twice just charge down the mountain like it was nothing. I mean, it, it blew my mind. I mean, she honestly covered like 50 feet in like two seconds. I mean, her feet must have touched the ground like four times. I mean, just like that full body stride where she's like stretching out her ribs mm -hmm. and just gliding across the landscape um, was amazing. But when it comes to snow leopards, like they don't need the same type of speed that a cheetah would. So like cheetahs are savanna predators. So like they're racing across this relatively open, like these grasslands, you know, this relatively flat terrain. Snow leopards are really like dive, literally diving down mountains and off of rocks to catch their prey. And one of the ways that they adapt to that is that, like I mentioned earlier, really long tails and using the scarves. But if you think about a boat, like if you're in the water and you're in a boat, you know, you've got like the little rudder in the back and basically the rudder moves this way and this way to help you go like left and right. It's like the steering wheel is in the back. Uh -huh. And snow leopards are the exact same way. They use those tails like oh, rudders cool. because they have to make these really quick turns yeah. on the landscape and they're not just flat. Like they're, you know, they're on the, they're literally diving down a mountain. And in order to be quick, and sure-footed, they need to have something balanced. They need to have something that can help them turn, and they need something that can help them balance. And that's why that long tail can basically whip back and forth. It helps them cut corners really quickly as they're, you know, diving back and forth to catch their prey. But it also, because it's as long as their body, it kind of helps them balance a little bit. And that's so that cool. kind of increases their agility um, and their speed. They're really fast. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so we have a few more donations. We're at three hundred twenty-eight dollars, guys. Thank you so much. Um, That's awesome. Thank predator you. Predator tipped three dollars and said, uh, "Asked, does she know if China or other countries where the snow leopards are native are trying to protect snow leopards and breeding them, like China is doing with pandas and such?" So that's a two-part question. The first question is, you know, country conservation. Um, so yes, uh, the countries, you know, where snow leopards are endemic, where snow leopards, you know, live, uh, those countries, their governments are working to save the snow leopards. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just like, you know, we've, we've got this problem in conservation where we talk about um, people going out and saving wildlife. And often we have this very Eurocentric mindset, this colonial mindset that, you know, we have to go into their places and save them because we know best. Mm -hmm. um, and one that's wrong, um, it's just not correct at all because, you know, I work in, I've been to China and Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan I've been in the field in China, in Kyrgyzstan, and I've worked with you know, Tibetan herders and Kyrgyz uh, herders who live alongside wildlife, and they know more about these cats than anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the governments in these countries, like China was the question, the Chinese government has a vested interest in their native wildlife. There are lots of nonprofit organizations and university organizations, just like here in the US, that are working in snow leopard country to conserve snow leopards. Um, what's even cooler is that all, a lot of these countries are also working together. Like earlier in the broadcast, I was talking about how like bobcats don't know if they're a, how does a bobcat know if it's a California bobcat or a Nevada bobcat? Um, just like a snow leopard doesn't know like, oh, am I a Kazakh state or am I a China bobcat? Or I'm sorry, a China snow leopard right. or a Kazakh snow leopard. Um, and so these governments work together because they know that snow leopards are traversing these, in, these trans boundary lines. Like, it does, you know, obviously for governments um, and territories, these lines mean something, but for wildlife, they ultimately don't. And so it's important for governments and organizations to work together in order to make sure snow leopards are protected across large, large landscapes. Because realistically, if you're protecting snow leopards in Tajikistan, you're protecting snow leopards in Kyrgyzstan, which is a country just north of, uh, of Tajikistan, because the snow leopards potentially are moving across these international boundaries. And if snow leopards are connected genetically across these large spatial scales, 
we're protecting you know populations uh, all over the world or all over Central Asia in the case of snow leopards. So okay. yes, to answer the question, they are all these countries are working together. Um, there are efforts going on right now that have been going on for many years, um, not just for individual country research and conservation, but for the intercontinent or the inter uh, transboundary different country relationships and projects as well, which cool. is really awesome. Good, that's awesome. That's good to know. Um, another question donation, Danny. Uh, said tip ten dollars thank you danny um and said how does panthera go about monitor monitoring the low density snow depth population giving the given that they're so elusive so we kind of talked about that earlier um that's when we were talking about poop um and and stuff like that is there is there more to answer that question that you have or yeah so there's a lot of different ways that's currently being done um realistically what it takes is collaboration 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 um you know i'm currently in delaware right now like i'm work on the ground and realistically you know panther collaborates with researchers in country as well as local communities um, to do a lot of different things and monitoring can include um, livestock protection uh, programs that basically empower communities to uh, help it helps them directly protect their livestock which reduces things like retaliatory killing or the need to kill snow leopards like if a snow leopard can't get into your paddock to kill your sheep you have no reason to kill one yes um, if your local government is, uh, it has empowered you to create an anti-poaching unit, you're more likely to protect snow leopards than kill them and put them on the black market because realistically the income is, is, is uh, more reliable if you're uh, effectively a government employee, you're protecting your own interests. Um, and so monitoring, can, it, monitoring is really tightly linked to empowering communities. These communities that live alongside wildlife have a totally different way of life than we do. We, they live on you know, things as little as $2 a day. You know, their um, wealth is, is basically measured by how many yak do they have, how many sheep do they have. Um, you know, these, particularly for nomadic communities, you know, in the summer they take their herds up into the mountains where they live alongside carnivores like bears and wolves and snow leopards. So realistically it's expected that some might be lost um, to, uh, to depredation by, snow, by a carnivore. But, Monitoring involves empowering those communities. It also involves the type of research that I do where you're like walking out and doing transects to try to um, look for snow leopard sign, looking for snow leopard scat. And then from that, you can go back out and sample again. Um, and that's called, uh, it's a technique called capture mark recapture. So you go out on day one, you collect a bunch of samples, you wait for a certain period of time, then you go back out to the same area and do the same collection and then you bring into the you come back into the lab and you see how many individuals you collected the second time, mm -hmm. and based on that you can kind of get like population number estimates. Um, other ways that we monitor populations involve radio collaring them, uh, which I you know is very important um, to kind of understanding movements, where are home ranges, how large are their territories, how many individuals are potentially in an area. Um, and then from these estimates, then we can kind of make reasonable inferences or recommendations to uh, to conservation managers. Um, you know, oh, we think that there are you know this many snow leopards in the area. We want to you know monitor that. And the way that we can maintain that is by doing um, uh, prey surveys. Like, how many blue sheep do we think are in this national park? And based on that number, in reality, we think maybe that can support X number of snow leopards. And so then it becomes about, you know, not just monitoring the snow leopard itself, but also about, you know, protecting the prey. And then when it comes to habitat, it's like, well, we know that snow leopards need, you know, X number of space in this part of their range. That's my cat in the background. <laughs> um, and if we're going to protect their habitat, we know that we protect snow leopards. So it's like a lot of different iterations and a lot of different methods. Um, obviously, the problem is that they are rare and elusive, and it is difficult. So it requires a lot of manpower, it requires a lot of knowledge, and it requires intimately uh, working with the communities, not as helpers, but as, you know, equal stakeholders in the process in order to actually get things done. Because, like, I wouldn't have been able to do anything in Kyrgyzstan if it weren't for uh, the Kyrgyz herders and local government officials that we work with, because, mm -hmm. you know, they have the knowledge, they know where the cats are, they're the ones that realistically have the power to let me in as a guest researcher, um, you know, to get a chance to study these, uh, these beautiful cats. Okay, nice. Um... One more question here, or donated question. And again, guys, thank you so much for the donations today. We're at $350. Thank you for evening awesome. that out, Zoe. Um, appreciate that. Uh, so your donations today, again, are going to Panthera. You can do Command Org in the chat if you want to see more about it. It'll go to research. It'll go to projects, programs um, to support the conservation of, of big cats, not just snow leopards, but um, 
all, all wildcat species. So thank you so much for your donations again. I appreciate it. Um, this other question is from Uber. It tipped $3 and asked if it's true that snow leopards like biting their own tails. I've never heard of that. Text with $50. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, so this is awesome. If you haven't seen it, there's a great video. I have no, or a great photo of snow leopard like literally like carrying its own tail okay. my cats come up to join the party so i'm gonna try to see like <laughs> this is one of my cats his tail is not as long as his body so you can't see but basically there's this <laughs> video of this like snow leopard carrying his tail like in his mouth like yeah. the toy uh-huh. sorry my cat is not probably he's like i am not i am not um <laughs> but yeah so i have no idea why i mean like so everything in captivity is different from everything in the wild, right? So, uh-huh. you know, in a, a good accredited zoo, they need to account for enrichment and entertaining the cats. Uh-huh. Um, and so there are certain things like nervous behaviors that might have, you know, resulted in that photo being taken. Uh-huh. But also realistically, like, if you have a house cat or you've ever seen a cat, like, cats are the same. Like, if you put a box out on a mountain, I bet you a cat's going to get into it. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, yeah. like, you know, there are great photos of, like, tigers and leopards at, you know, sanctuaries, like, sitting in cardboard boxes. Like, all yeah. cats are created equal in that way. And, you know, certainly there are videos of, like, of camera traps of snow leopard cubs, like, hiding behind rocks and, like, ah, jumping out and, like, attacking its That's mother so or funny. chasing her tail. And so realistically, like if you're bored and you're just like hanging out on a mountain waiting for, you know, a blue sheep to go by, I mean, why not? <laughs> Eat citrus. Grab your tail, like <laughs> take a walk with it. <laughs> citrus, thank you for the $50 and Tito for the $5. Thank you guys so much. Really, thank really you. appreciate those donations today. Yeah, you're, you're totally right about the, the all cats being cats thing. I, I, um, <laughs> we have a tiger at the, at the zoo that I work at and we made her a like a frozen blood cake for her birthday and it was multiple tears and it was beautiful and I spent like an hour on it and we put it on a piece of cardboard in her enclosure and she walked up to it and she grabbed the cardboard and then walked away like no interest in it she (laughs) she pulled the cardboard out from under the cake and she walked away and she jumped in her in like this tub that she had and was just playing with the cardboard it was devastating right nothing better than wet cardboard (laughs) yeah text with $45 again text thank you so much thank Um, you that's awesome. So let's see what other questions we have here. You guys have asked a lot of really good questions. Thank you so much. Um, we, we, of, if people have questions about like stuff that's not snow leopards too. Um, yeah, I, I was to just going to ask well. you one of those. Um, one of them is, and I think a lot of people have been wondering how you got into, um, I'm trying to find the actual question. It's, it's generally how you got into big cat research and, and, a little bit about your journey. Uh, one of them, Fire, asked, how was your journey through university? Yeah, um, uh, arduous and different. Okay. Um, you know, so I guess I'll preface this, but there's not really any one way to become a wildlife biologist. I mean, there are obviously like the paths that you want to take, and I'll briefly mention that. Um, but there's not really any one way to do the type of work that I do. And realistically, like when you go to school, you don't say I'm going to be a dolphin biologist. Like maybe that's your goal, but you can't take classes that like put you specifically down that pathway. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the work that I do, I, I realized that I wanted to be a wildlife biologist in 2008. Um, I did a really awesome study abroad in Australia where we were looking at the uh, interface between livestock and wildlife. Uh, because at the time I was an animal science major and I wanted to be a veterinarian, so I was pre-vet. Um, and it was a really cool opportunity to kind of see how another country deals with their livestock industry or, you know, their farming industry um, and how they deal with, you know, like a herd of kangaroos, like, mm-hmm. you know, running through their fields. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have that here. Um, <laughs> and it was a great experience, but we I was remember sitting in this lecture about coral reef die off. And it was one of those really weird, like paradigm shift moments where it's just like, I'm sitting there, like my mouth is hanging open. I'm like, whoa, like there are so many problems, but so many solutions that are so much bigger than me. And I want to be a part of that. Like what, like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Um, And I learned about, you know, this tiger sanctuary that was not far from my university. So I got my bachelor's at North Carolina State University, and there's this phenomenal uh, big cat sanctuary called uh, Carolina Tiger Rescue in North Carolina. It's great because it's a no-touch facility. They rescue individual cats of several different species that have been held in uh, private ownership. 
um, which for those of you that don't know, it's like really easy to own a tiger in certain parts of the United States. Like there are more captive tigers in the state of Texas than there are in the wild, yes, which I've heard that blows so my before. mind. It's hugely problematic. Like nobody knows what they're doing. You would never catch me trying to own a tiger or a snow leopard. Like I, no, like it just doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, sorry, that's like my my side. No, I totally that. agree. Citrus, by the way, Citrus, uh, thank you for seventy five dollars. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so no, much. that's awesome. Um, anyway, so I you know I was in this class and I realized that I wanted to be different and I learned about this tiger sanctuary and I applied for an internship and I was selected and I worked there for a little over a year. Um, granted, it was on captive animals, but like I already talked about the importance of of you know, accredited zoos or sanctuaries and how they, you know, help conservation. Um, and that really got me interested in carnivore conservation specifically. And I was really interested in being a cheetah biologist. I was like, cheetahs, man, that's it. That's my thing. I'm into it. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to save the cheetahs. In my last semester of college, I had this professor who sat me down and she's like, you know that you can't just like go out and be a cheetah biologist, right? And that basically broke my heart, um, you know, because like, well, well then what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to, save all the cats if I can't go out and be a cheetah biologist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, this, this professor told me, she's like, you need to be useful for conservation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's important to have passion and interest, but you can't help cheetahs or pandas or, you know, peregrine falcons if you don't have a skill set to offer uh, that addresses a specific conservation need. And so that's really what started my journey into working in carnivore ecology. So after I got my bachelor's degree, I went to Montana and we tracked bobcats. We did vegetation surveys, um, looking at, you know, uh, we did vegetation surveys and prey surveys to see like what bobcats were eating, what type of ha habitat, you know, bobcats and their prey lived in. Um, you know, then I did the Smithsonian internship and then I worked on bears, I worked on foxes, I worked on mustelids. Um, and, you know, then I started my master's degree in realistic it wasn't that, oh, I worked on and touched all of these different cool species, although yes, that's part of it. It's because I chose a, spe a specific discipline that has an important conservation application right now. Mm -hmm. So like I work in molecular ecology. I, you know, genetic tools are the tools that I use to try to help whatever species that I'm working on. And realistically, as long as I have poop, as long as I can do that for anything. Like I can work, I can work on, and I have worked on salamanders. You know, I've worked on coyotes. I've worked on gray foxes. And you know, being able to have something to offer, whether it's you know maybe you're really good at statistics, maybe you're really good at um, you know tracking wildlife, or maybe you're really good at public policy or education. You know, like you know Maya, you work in a zoo. Like that's a very specific niche that is needed in order to be successful in this field. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and so for me, I, I worked really hard for two years after I got my bachelor's degree to make up kind of an educational deficit because I got a degree in animal science, which doesn't really help me as a wildlife biologist because I hadn't had courses in like mammalogy or conservation biology or ecology or wildlife management. Um, so I did all these different uh, jobs like as an assistant to give me some of these like practical field based skills that would make me competitive for a master's program later on. Um, and then I, I got into my master's project at West Texas A&M University, and I studied bobcat landscape genetics. And, you know, really, that's when I was really working with poop a lot um, and working with genetic tools and, um, you know, collaborating with other researchers in Texas that are doing bobcat ocelot research. Um, and, you know, after I got my master's degree, I worked on salamanders for a while doing the same thing. I switched out of carnivores and, you know, worked in amphibians for a while, and I loved it. Um, and then my current advisor contacted me about designing a project that involved genetics for snow leopards. Yeah. Um, I got really lucky. My In 2012, I interviewed with my current advisor to be his first master's student. He was advertising for a project in Tajikistan, looking at the impacts of um, uh, poaching and hunting of snow leopard prey in two different areas to kind of see if, if you know, regulated hunting helps snow leopards or increases their numbers, which it looks like in that project that it does. Um, and I interviewed for the project, but I didn't get it. I wasn't successful, and that's largely just because I didn't have the coursework or some of the field work, like some of the knowledge that was really needed for that project. Um, but we stayed in touch, and, you know, couple, fast forward a couple years, you know, I'd really kind of solidified my knowledge and, and interest in learning more about genetics. And when he reached out to me and asked about if I'd want to interview or, you know, for a project, it was between me and a couple of like one or two other people. Um, you know, I said that I would want to do a project only if it had a genetic component, because that's my skill set. That's how I am useful for conservation. Um, and we designed a project together. And, you know, now here I am, you know, as a concert, as a conservation biologist. 
Um, I'm not working with cheetahs. Uh, I have a really good, I have some good friends who work with cheetahs um, and it's, you know, they do amazing work. So, I mean, my skill set, I could go work on cheetahs eventually, um, but I have, I have left cheetahs behind as the best big cat. You already heard it. Like I've put it out there. It's recorded. It's official. Sell leverage of the best big cat. All right. Um, I'm, I'm willing to entertain other, other uh, perspectives in the comments. You can tell me why you think, you know, Jaguars are the best and I'll nod my head, but celebrities are the best. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's just kind of like this weird amalgamation of, of experiences that I cobbled together to try to be useful for something while also chasing a specific dream. I mean, if, you know, if I hadn't gotten into snow leopards, like before I was working uh, on this project, I was out in California working on a Martin project and Martins are yeah. um, ferret-like stellids. They're adorable. We were, um, I was helping someone else's project. We were radio collaring Martins and tracking their uh, their den sites in the summer to see how like where they nest with their babies. Um, and I could have potentially tried to go down that path if if there had been use for me and there had been like availability for me to like pursue it, like, you know, uh, long term. Um, and I would have been happy doing that. I mean, studying carnivores is really my main interest. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, fortunately, I've been able to to do what I wanted to do, which was to work with big cats. Um, so. Hopefully I'll continue, I'll be able to continue doing that, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. Okay, very, so Zach just took $20, thank you so much. Night thank with $5, you. we're at $625, we hit that yes, $600 mark, awesome. thank you guys so much. Um, another question about, about you and your research was, um, how physically intense has it been hiking and with the mountain climbing that you do, do you enjoy it? Um, that's from Shipwright, thank you for that question. Yeah, Shipwright. So. It is hard. Um, so I guess I'll back up and how do I answer this? Like really honestly, um, it is difficult. So this, let me back up. So last year, so in fall of 2018, I was in China for about six weeks. Um, I was in Beijing kind of prepping some field work and then I got to go out into the field. So we were on the Tibetan plateau, which is, you know, a high elevation flat plateau in China that is surrounded by mountains and that's where a lot of snow leopards are. Like some of the most pristine snow leopard habitat in the world is on the Tibetan Plateau. Um, it's just beautiful pristine ecosystems, but you know, it, it goes up to like 18,000 feet in elevation. Um, and the highest in elevation that I had ever been was at 12,000 in New Mexico. And if you don't know, the higher in elevation that you go, the higher up you go, the less oxygen there is. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the slope, like how steep up the mountain is it? It's about how much oxygen there is. And obviously there's the temperature. If it's cold, you know, that can be limiting. Um, you know, so for me, prior to going out into the field, there was training involved. So that's, you know, basically how, how can I increase my um, muscular endurance, but more potentially more importantly, how can you maximize your cardiovascular endurance? And short of like putting a plastic bag on my head and just running the stairs, right. um, which I didn't do, but I might do next year. Um, you know, you, it's about basically trying to challenge your heart rate at increasing, um, like, uh, uh, what is the word slopes? So like, if you're like on a, if you just basically like run, if I was going to run on a run on it flat, I would run a run, want to run on an incline or just, you know, climb stairs a lot. Yeah. Um, it was really difficult though, because last year when I was in China, we were out in the field, you get out there and it's like your first day and like you're huffing and puffing. 30 feet and I'm tired. Like there's just not enough oxygen. Like I can't catch my breath. So we have supplemental oxygen, which is literally like, it looks like a can of hairspray and it has like a little mask and you can, it's just pure oxygen. And that's basically, you're trying to oxygenate your muscles while you're adapting to a lower oxygen environment. Wow. Um, and so it requires, uh, you need to acclimate to it. So like I went to a little city at like 9,000 feet and spent the night there. Um, just to try to give my body 24 hours, like a night of sleeping at this higher elevation to, you know, try to gradually adjust my system. Uh, but then we were out in the field, everything was fine. Like I'm a little out of breath. It's not a big deal. We've been there for four days, um, but then it snowed. And based on the information I've been able to gather, the problem when it snows in the winter at higher elevation at low temperature is that snow reduces the barometric pressure. And it has something, I, I don't work in like physics, so I don't exactly understand how this works. I'm probably not gonna explain it very well, but it basically influences how much oxygen is in the environment. So if you're already in a low oxygen environment and then the snow dumps, it, it, it basically increases your risk of getting high altitude or elevation sickness. Okay. So most of the people that I talked to after the fact said, yeah, 
a lot of the people that we know that get elevation sickness tend to get it in the winter as opposed to the summer. It's not exclusive, but that's just a thing. So we were surprised when I'd been in the field for four days and I was fine. It snowed, I woke up and I was not doing well. I had a really bad headache. Um, like an elevation headache feels like someone puts a belt around your head and just squeezes. Um, uh, you know, your balance is off, your equilibrium is off and it can get worse. And if you don't account for it when it's really bad, sorry, this is my cat again, um, it can be very medically dangerous. You can have, um, uh, I can't remember the actual term. Basically there is a, it can affect you in two ways. One, the blood vessels in your lungs start to rupture a little bit or like the capillaries do. And basically your lungs can fill up with fluid and you drown. Mm. Oh. Um, it's, a uh, uh, something edema and then there's the other one is where you get an edema in your brain where you you get fluid on your brain oh um, and those are very serious and yeah. it doesn't happen immediately like and just because you get a little elevation sickness you get a headache doesn't mean you're in cri medical crisis by any means but I was bad enough after we, we drove back to the city which was lower ele slightly higher elevation which was a problem we had to get back to a city with electricity and internet we had to go up um, I stayed the night I took some elevation medication Still sick the next day my heart rate my, my resting heart rate was too high and so we agreed that i had to leave um so i left unfortunately about a week earlier which was a huge bummer i was really upset about it, it you know it's kind of hard to not take that personally like oh i trained or i thought i was in good shape like i've been a field biologist for years and like the first time i you know really get out in some leopard habitat like you know i get sick and i gotta go home mm -hmm. um you know, so this summer when I went back to Snow Leopard Habitat, I um, changed what I did. So obviously there's like physically trying to train here, but I live in Delaware, like it's flat. Like yeah. we're not far above sea level. And I was born in North Carolina, so I don't have whatever genetic markers. I don't have the alleles in my system that, you know, I didn't grow up at high elevation. I don't have like my, my family doesn't grow up at high elevation. So I don't have these adaptations. So um, kind of armed with that knowledge and, you know, knowing what it was like to get really, really sick, um, I treated it a little bit differently. So there's medication that you can take. It's called acetazolamide, which is, I just love saying that, by the way. Um, it's a medication that, um, I can't remember the mechanism exactly, but basically it helps you precipitate a chemical out of your body that is produced when you don't have the, as much oxygen as you need. And that chemical is what contributes to elevation sickness and all of the horrible things that I just described. Um, but if you take, you can take that medication preventatively. Like you take it before you get at elevation and while you're at elevation as your body adapts. Mm -hmm. um, I made the mistake last time of not taking it preventatively. I only took it like once I got sick and it was yeah. kind of too late at that point. Um, so I did that, but I also spent a week like doing nothing at elevation before we started hiking as opposed okay. to like 24 hours. I spent like five days. Um, which was kind of boring. Like, I'm just kind of like sitting in a hotel, like, you know, drumming my fingers, like, great. Like, when is the headache going to go away? Like, feel and get work done. Um, and it was, it was much better. So like, you know, my first day out in Snow Leopard Habitat, we hiked up to 13,000 feet. And like literally a week later, I was like hiking up mountains at 15,000 feet. And yes, I was out of breath and I kind of wanted to die a little bit, but I didn't <laughs> die because I was prepared. Um, so it is physically challenging, but it's a different type of physically challenging. Like yeah. I am not a runner. Uh -huh, me I hate running. It's horrible. Like I, you know, kudos to you guys who like to run. I want to be more like you in 2020, but that type of endurance activity doesn't like float my boat, but hiking mountains does like I consider it more difficult, but I can go more slowly. Like not having uh, oxygen is like a great equalizer. Like someone who's a marathon runner is going to go a little bit faster than me on a mountain, but they're not going to go that much faster because there's only so it's only, you can only go so fast when you're going straight up a mountain and you're climbing over boulders and there's no oxygen. Right. Like, we all need oxygen to survive. So, you know, it's like sustained activity that you can do over long periods of time um, without needing to be like this marathon runner. Like I, I don't consider myself, I mean, I'm athletic, but I don't consider myself some hardcore athlete. So as long as you do the things that I described and like you do a little bit of training, like it's kind of slow and steady wins the race. Like yeah. that's basically what it boils down to. Yeah. Someone just said you played soccer talking to me. That is so different from running. <laughs> two yeah, very no. different things. I love soccer I need, and sports. I hate running. I need to play soccer. Um, I I was gonna say I guess all cardio things that you know would mean that you would be able to be faster on a landscape. So yeah. I'm gonna add that to my list of considerations for 2020 is playing nice. soccer. <laughs> cool. Um, high tip. $41, thank you. Connor with $5 and SMK with $20. Thank you guys so much again. Thank you. Um, most of you, I think, have been here. If you're just getting here, the donations are going to Panthera today. 
Um, they do research. They they support programs and and people like Imogene doing doing research for big cats. Rowdy with eight dollars and thirty four cents to round us out to seven hundred dollars in donations. Thank you so much, Rowdy, for doing that. That's awesome. Um, so moving into a, a little bit of a different topic, if if you're cool with that. Um, Absolutely. And this this will probably be the last thing that we're talking about is Tietl asked, is she looking more into science communication as a focus? You do a really, really, really great job with your social media. Guys, you can do a command guest in chat if you'd like to follow her socials. I put her Twitter and her Instagram there. Um, science comm is something that you're really good at. Can you tell us about that and why you think that's important? Yeah, so I started science communication in like 2000. You, posted photos of like- You just cut out there. One more, say oh. that again. You started in when? Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, so I started Science Communication in 2013. I made an Instagram account. Well, no, I started really in 2009 because the internship at the Tiger Sanctuary that I did required that we kept a journal. Okay. And so I started a blog. Um, and really it was just like my mom reading it. <laughs> um, you know, and I would basically write stories about things that I experienced and I really enjoy writing. Um, the first thing I ever wanted to do was be a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love sharing stories of things that are relevant. And, and realistically, like whether or not you're a biologist like me, or you're a lawyer, or you're you know still in high school. Wildlife is relevant to everybody, and so making it digestible and accessible is really what this is what my science communication is all about. Um, whether it's just learning trivia facts, or you know knowing that this could be a career for you, you know it's important for everybody to uh, be exposed to wildlife because you're exposed to wildlife every single day. Whether you're not, whether or not like you live in New York City, or you're indoors, or you you know think snakes are gross, like you're still exposed every single day, which mm -hmm. is awesome. Yeah. Um, so I started, you know, I really kind of picked up the social media routine when I made an Instagram to post about like critters that I was like experiencing or interacting with or like finding or like, you know, pretty hikes that I was going on. Um, and I just kind of built a, the following really organic. Um, Instagram featured me randomly in 2015, I think. It was like 20 outdoors people that you should follow. And oh. that's really what kind of like, they, you know, I didn't know what was happening until all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I've got like 3,000 person you just cut um, out for all of that for some reason i heard oh i did i okay it cut out at, at three thousand i think okay yeah sorry um you know i i got like all of these i got like three thousand followers like overnight and that was kind of wild to me just because yeah. i don't know like yeah it's just, it's just wild to me like social media is a crazy mm -hmm. um the wild place but yeah so i've been doing science communication because i think it's so important for people to have access yeah. to wildlife um whether it's as a career or as a pastime like Realistically, conservation decisions are made by everyday people like you and me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our governments don't do things for the environment or for wildlife out of this altruistic, you know, desire to make the world better. They, our governments do things for wildlife when the people who they represent make noise about them. And we're not going to make noise about wildlife or care about wildlife if we don't know about it. Right. And so that's realistically like my entire goal. And the kind of motivation or the idea behind it is that like, yeah, I do molecular ecology. I do this very like specific, narrow, specialized research, mm -hmm. but I can't do it by myself. Like I require, like I can't access this data that I need to get things done that we all need if I'm not working with local communities, if we're not empowering, you know, the Muslim herders in Kyrgyzstan, if we're not, you know, being mindful about the, the, the faith that you know guides Tibetan herders in China. If we're not accounting for you know the actual like monetary needs of the communities that live alongside wildlife, um, and so for me, science communication is really about like lifting many people in order to get things done that benefit all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, professionally, I am interested in continuing what I'm doing now. Like I love working with genetics. I love, or, you know, I love. I love working with cat poop. I, I think it's interesting. It just satisfies that itch of like figuring something out. Like that's, you know, kind of what gets me going. It's like, I want to do problem solving. So like that satisfies like my personal in interest. Yeah. But then from like, you know, the greater good, like I'm doing something, you know, for a species that, you know, deserves to exist in its own right, but also has this huge like cascading effect on, on other people. Yeah. You know, yeah. like what is it, like a third of the world's water Exist, is is stored like fresh water a third of the water that feeds a third of the human population is tied up in snow leopard habitat so oh, if you protect that. snow leopards that requires protecting snow leopard habitat and that basically protects the water that feeds a third of the entire world wow and so like thinking about stuff like that like that's where science community 
that comes in. Like that's how snow leopards benefit you and you and you. Right. Um, but yeah, science communication is something that I definitely want to do. Like I worked with a really cool team of people uh, two years ago. We crowdfunded for a project on Instagram. We were really interested in looking at like do selfies on Instagram taken by scientists uh-huh. help public perceptions of scientists. So like yeah. realistically, like scientists. I read, your, were... I read your paper on this yesterday. Nice. Okay, Thank but, you. Yeah, she she wrote a really interesting paper. You guys, uh, I don't know what the title was, but it was it was something about using selfies to make science to scientists more accessible or yeah but can continue please yeah no so i mean that's like nail on the head like it's like using can scientists selfie stereotypes about scientists and yeah. basically the answer is yes like realistically view scientists as like competent but not necessarily warm and the issue is that when it comes to trust we need both of those we need trust we need warmth like is the person friendly and is the person like an expert are they competent and without you know warmth it makes the whole trust cycle really difficult. And in this age where we have things like climate change and you know we've got all these environmental disasters going on, the experts that study these things, that understand these things are who we should be listening to. Like what is it, I saw a, t- a tweet, it was like every horror film, like the opening scene is when someone doesn't listen to a scientist in a white coat. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you know, that's totally true, but like realistically not every scientist wears a white coat and you know, making the scientists more accessible, making people realize that like, I'm just like an every other person. I happen to do science. I am a scientist, but I'm also like a person who, you know, has cats and I, I like to eat pho and, you know, I listen to really great music or yeah. whatever. Um, the selfies were a way for us to, to try to like quantitatively measure, can we change the perceptions of scientists? And the answer is yes. So like by having conversations like we're having right now, science is more accessible. It's not some big like, you know, pie in the sky. It's not like lofty, like really brilliant people in like their ivory towers. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm not brilliant. It's just, you know, you know what I mean? Like it just, it just, it is what it is. Um, and so for me, science communication is trying about like constructing all of those things to mm-hmm. make people understand the importance of science. But yeah. also my hope is that maybe someone watching this right now says, well, Dane, if she can do it, why can't I do it? And that's the question that like I ask myself is like someone's got to do something why not me mm-hmm. and that's basically what you know someone watching this can go on to like change the world like maybe the next president is watching this maybe you know the person who cures like cancer is watching this maybe the person who can single-handedly address issues you know around tiger conservation is watching this and it's just everyday people so for me incorporating that in the type of research that I do is really important um, I think at the end of the day, I really still want to be able to work. I kind of want to have my cake and eat it too. I want to be able to continue with science communication and continue doing research as well, because I think that, you know, that's where the stories are created. Like that's, we, you know, in order to have material, in order to have a story to tell, I want to be able to have experiences that are relevant for wildlife, but also for people to incentivize them to care. So then they can be like, just as, you know, uh, nerdy as me and you, uh, you know, about these things, which obviously everyone watching here is. So, like, we're already doing a good job yeah. like, together. <laughs> Someone in chat just said, that's it, I'm changing careers again. I don't think, that's awesome. Yeah. I don't, you don't have to change careers. Guys, it means a lot that you're here listening to this. Yeah. Um, that's that's the important thing about this podcast. You guys already know that. Um, yeah. The other important thing about this podcast is Dead with $20 and Loch Ness with $20 text with seven dollars to even it out to eight hundred dollars in donations thank you guys so much thank you appreciate that um this link that i put in chat you guys is not an ip grabber (laughs) that is that's imogene's paper about the selfies if you're interested in checking that out that's what that link is for um aria tipped five dollars anonymous with a hundred dollars wow oh my gosh and so and san with ten dollars um said thank you so much to you um, Aria with the five dollars before said, "I'm finishing my major in biology. Congratulations, good for you. That's awesome. Yeah, congrats. Um, so we're at nine hundred and fifteen dollars, you guys. Whoa. Thank you so much. Um, can't this blows my mind. That it's so awesome that you do this. By thank I gotta you. Know, like Maya is doing like this. Imp- Honestly, like you know, so many, so much research. Basically, at the end of the day, like we don't have money, we can't get stuff done. And you know, even in the United States, you know, our governments." create funds for states and federal agencies to do research to protect our wildlife, but it still comes down to like funding inconsistencies. So like this is such important work and it's so cool that you guys are all participating in it. Like conservation is a grassroots effort and every single individual stakeholder 
has equal importance. So what you guys are doing is amazing. You're awesome. You should be proud of yourself. And like my, you know, steering this ship is majorly awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's awesome. You guys, yeah, even if even if you're not able to donate, thank you so much for being here. There are what, like yep. 1,700 people here. Anonymous with $85, so we're at $1,000. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, there, there are like 1,700 people here, you guys. Thank you so much. If you're not donating, that's totally okay. I just really that's appreciate awesome. you listening. Knowledge um, is power, so. Yeah, this is, this is wonderful. Is, so, Eva Jean, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about um, before we close up here? Well, we've already established that Snow Leopards are the best. Yes. Um, and we've already established that poop science is where it's at. Absolutely. Um, we've also established that, you know, science is important for everyone. And, and science is for everyone. So, you know, for me to kind of like build on that last question, people are like, why do you do science communication? Like, do you foresee doing it? Yes, I do foresee continuing to do it because realistically, like when I was a kid and I was like chasing frogs um, and watching like toads metamorphose from tadpoles into adults, mm -hmm. I had no idea that this was a career option. Like I had no idea that people watched tadpoles for a living. You know, like yeah. if you told me that someone like picked up poop for a living, I'd be like, well, first of all, why? Second of all, <laughs> cool. Um, and, and the exposure is so incredibly important. And realistically, we need science to look like the rest of the world. And we need like diverse stakeholders and diverse people and diverse cultures to play a role in this, you know, community based um, effort, whether it is like here in the United States, or it's globally, um, regardless of the species of the project, expertise exists at all levels and across all cultures um, and across all different backgrounds. And realistically, that's what we need conservation to look like. No one person or no one group has more knowledge or more, um, or I guess no, no one group has more knowledge than any other, and no group really has any right to do what they do if they don't involve local communities. And that's what is so important to me. It's like, I love what I do and I'm so proud to be a snow leopard biologist. I'm so proud that I get to do this and, and have this experience. And some, you know, people are like, see me as a snow leopard expert. But at the end of the day, like I'm not the only expert. And you know, there are a lot of people in the world that live in Central Asia that have been doing this far longer than I have. Mm -hmm. And you know, elevating and centering those voices is incredibly important to me. And thinking about that, regardless of the species that you study, um, especially if you're working internationally, I think is really, really important. And those are the types of thoughts that I want to kind of like foster in my science communication in order to make sure that we actually come up with solutions that are worthwhile. Like if we don't, if we don't think about people, we're not actually helping conservation. Right. Um, and people, like people in conservation, don't just look like me. Right. Um, and I think that's really important. I know that's like a super like, uh, you know, deep thought process, but I think that's really, really important for us. No, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's awesome. You guys, again, we got another $5. Thank you so much. Um, he said, Thanks. can you repeat all of that? I forgot to click my pen and didn't get any of it. Good one. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Find me on Twitter. We'll talk about it. <laughs> yes, guys. Again, command guest in chat. Go follow Imogene on Twitter and Instagram. They're, they're wonderful. She does really well on, on both platforms. Um, thank you so much for your time today. You're like an awesome comeback guest. This was brilliant. This was, this was a really, really good podcast. Thank you so much. Guys, no, thank you for having me. What'd you think? How'd you feel? Everything went pretty well. Everything went pretty smooth. Good. Claps. Everybody's clapping for you. Awesome. Well, <laughs> a thank lot you of guys. hearts and a lot of claps. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be in touch with this donation. $1,005 um, is all going to uh, Panthera today. So thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you for your donations. Imogene, thank you again for being here. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Okay. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys right, as well. I'll we'll talk, talk soon. soon. I'll see you online. Okay. Bye. Great.